Um, I'm Robin Dowden, Director of the Walker's New Media Initiatives Department, and it is my pleasure to introduce Julie Beeler, Co-Principal of Second Story Interactive. Since 1994, Portland-based Second Story has become a leading developer of interactive media experiences. Their award-winning projects forge powerful and memorable connections between individuals and ideas by focusing on how people learn and how they experience their environments. I first became familiar with Second Story in the mid-90s through TerraQuest and virtual field trips to the Galapagos in Antarctica. Their early work would define interactive expeditions and set a high bar for education websites by weaving compelling narrative with interactive maps, photography, rich media, and access to subject specialists. Today, their work in the area of interactive touchscreens is redefining how visitors connect with artifacts within the museum. From two 26-foot Great War tables in the National World War I Museum to the interactive screens at LA's Natural History Museum, their work provides museum visitors with unprecedented access to content and the stories behind exhibitions. Second Story's clients include many of the world's outstanding museums, media, and cultural institutions, including the Smithsonian Institution, the Museum of Modern Art, the J. Paul Getty Museum, PBS, National Geographic Society, as well as AIGA, to name a few. Their hallmark style is seeped in graphically rich, yet highly detailed information architecture, where they excel in providing clear and intuitive access to archives and artifacts as well as staging compelling storytelling features for the web, kiosks, and other digital media displays. Julie Beeler is co-founder and managing director of Second Story. With a background in visual design, art history, and liberal arts, Julie leads the studio in shaping unique, innovative, immersive adventures that invoke curiosity, spur discovery, and inspire audiences. And now, without further ado, Julie Beeler. Thank you very much uh, to the Walker Art Center and to Robin for that very generous introduction and for Andrew for inviting me to be here tonight. I'm honored to be here and have enjoyed my day. Everyone said, oh, it's so gloomy out there. And I said, well, I'm from Oregon. It's like that every day. So I have uh, enjoyed it. I wanted to give a little bit of background on myself. I am the co-founder and principal at Second Story. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and I studied uh, graphic design and art history at the University of Pacific in Stockton. And not to date myself too much, but it was back in the days when uh, designers cut ruby lith and set type. And it wasn't until uh, my freshman year that I was introduced to Illustrator 88, and then I got my own Macintosh computer. I met. Um, Susanna and Rudy at Emigre, and from there everything started to evolve into the world that I work with today, with designing, with technology, and so forth. Um, the, the background I wanted to give a little bit because I really, I started in graphic and communication design, and I think that those principles in design are really key to being able to bring those kinds of experiences to other platforms, whether they're technology-based or non-technology-based. And as I got really enamored with the media itself while I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area, I loved the old CD-ROM titles like Myst and Encarta and the Voyager titles, and they really got me excited on ways to tell stories and bring content and give access to information. So I decided I would leave the world of, of communication and graphic design, move in to interactive design, and set off on my adventure. And that led us to the starting of Second Story. I uh, met my partner, Brad Johnson, and we created a studio. And you can see here some pictures that had animated through. I got a little ahead of my slideshow. But our mission at Second Story is really to entertain, educate, and inspire through storytelling innovation, and using specifically design and interactive media design to do that. It all started with a little clothespin called Pinch. Uh, Bragg created this. This is our clothespin display at Second Story. It is a story about a fictitious clothespin. Um, we learn everything you've ever wanted to know about Little Pinch. I'm going to play an excerpt here. And I always like to show this because this is a self-promotion piece. And I think I'm, I'm from that era where you created things that you were passionate about as a way to leverage different opportunities for yourself. And Bragg created this self-promotion piece, Pinch. And this is what launched our studio. 
he thought in the beginning he would just be a digital artist and be an illustrator and do 3D. And pretty soon he got enamored with storytelling and time-based experiences as well as so did I. And so pretty soon we started to create uh, projects for our clients that were telling these kinds of stories. So I thought it would be fun to go back to the Wayback Machine of 1994 when you could fit this whole entire presentation on a floppy disk that was 1.4 megabytes and you could get animation, sound, etc., on it. So we won't play the entire pinch piece here. I think I can fast forward through this, but it was a great opportunity. In the web as we know it in 1995 was spawn. It started a whole era for our studio creating entertaining, engaging, and immersive experiences. And this is a little 90 second clip I wanted to show of a quick 10 year history of our studio and the kinds of experiences um, that we've created over time. So this shows you know, working on the web back in 95, 96, 97, some of the projects Robin mentioned of how she learned of our studio and then continuing to advance as our browsers became more and more advanced, as our bandwidth increased and everything allowed us to create much more immersive experiences, we found that our roots in multimedia and our roots in the web enabled us to create experiences. These were some of our first museum projects up at the Experience Music Project. And we were able to take that understanding of technology and design and craft it to create more immersive experiences online. And as bandwidth continued to improve and improve, we could start to embed videos and more media-rich types of experiences. So I just wanted to play this because I, I don't want to spend a lot of time tonight talking about the kinds of projects we've done, but rather I want to look at some of our current projects, some of the things we're working on, and how we go about to build these kinds of storytelling, narrative-driven projects. I think our little clip here has, has come to an end. So the studio um, is in Portland, Oregon. We are a team of um, designers and uh, technologists and storytellers that are dedicated to interactive media. And I've got some slides here of all the different types of team members. It's a very multidisciplinary studio. In our design area, we have everything from architects to 3D designers to information graphic designers, user experience designers, environmental graphic designers. And then on our technology side, we have everything from engineers to um, digital media artists to systems developers to interactive developers and really bringing that art and technology together. But we couldn't do that without the content and without the stories. And we have filmmakers on staff, we have content strategists, we have researchers, we have writers, we have producers, we have editors that bring all that together. And so it's really through kind of those three core disciplines that we're able to create the kinds of projects that we create. I wanted to give a little bit of insight. This is, I'm not going to play this whole video, but this is kind of a behind the scenes video of the environment of our studio, the kind of work we're doing, and how we're bridging these worlds together. Here we are in our media lab where we're looking at some different kinds of technology for some of these large displays that I'll talk about in a few minutes at the University of Oregon. There are some of our developers having a good time. We're working a lot with different technology devices and platforms and finding ways to bring experiences to life for visitors no matter where they are because truly interactive media allows visitors to get what they want when they want and how they want it and finding different ways to deliver those kinds of experiences. We also have an environment that allows us to get to know our visitors and bring in users. I'm going to try to jump to this clip. We are lucky with the space that we have where we can bring in um, all kinds of younger audiences, older audiences. We have a dog here that frequents. We have lots of dogs that come to the studio. Um, these are some large installations we're working on, but what's really great is that we can have students come in, we can have educators, we can have general audience members, experts come in. So I'll jump through, I'll let some of this play. And we can experiment our technology with them because ultimately at the end of the day, the kinds of experiences that we're creating are geared 
towards our users, towards our visitors, towards our guests, and always being able to work with them and understand how to craft these visitor experiences that are going to be meaningful to them um, is a great opportunity to do that here in our lab. I lost track of where our kids are, but we, we often bring them in and have them play around and so forth. I think they must have been here at the end or I jumped over them somehow. There they are. So a really fun place where we can do all kinds of user testing, evaluate some of our initial projects. The project here that the kids are playing with is just a little thing that we made. It's just to test multi-touch input, how visitors are interacting with it, what their dialogue and discourse is, and so forth. And then I'll talk here at the end a lot of things that we're doing now with gaming experiences and with the Wii from a few years ago and the Kinect and finding ways that, of course, we are hacking the Kinect, which is not uh, politically correct, according to Microsoft, but doing experiments to find ways to get that visitor contribution involved in, in our project. So ultimately, we're a team of of liberal artists, we are interested in the arts, we're interested in humanities, we're interested in science, because we're dedicated desi to designing for wonder. And this up that you have, the first slide showed that when you come into our studio, you're greeted with a, a crocodile hanging upside down in our entryway. Um, that's a signature piece for Wunderkammers. And Wunderkammers are precursors to museums as we know them today. And there's something that we, everyone at Second Story is very passionate about, is how to um, pique curiosities, inspire wonder, and create these experiences where the visitors have emotive connections to the content. And we have our own Wunderkammer at times. We have uh, created our own installations here where we have mixed real objects and artifacts along with some of our digital interpretations of them. And uh, you know, here we're at a museum today, and I couldn't actually believe what happened to me today. And uh, I was here visiting the Walker Arts Center, which is an amazing institution. And as I started to move through the space, and, and you look at the objects, and you know, these are these are valuable objects that culture has a desire to preserve and conserve into the future, to educate and to inform and to connect audiences. And as I got to the sixth floor, here was a whole installation about Wunderkammer. And I was just floored and I was so excited and I was I wanted to jump up and down and scream, and then I remembered I was in an art museum and I needed to be quiet. And I was I just couldn't believe it that here something that it, we're so passionate about and something that we've created a whole studio to realize the opportunities dedicated to that. But here in the museum, at the time I'm giving my presentation, they're looking at putting the juxtaposition of objects, anthropological, scientific, whatever they may be, putting those together to create relationships, to further the knowledge and understanding of them, to connect them to cultures, to ideas, to concepts. And, Nothing more exciting than a midnight party Wunderkammer. I thought that was, was wonderful. So for all of you that haven't been up to see this, I, I highly recommend it. It's a real, you could spend hours in there. Just your, your curiosity is amazing. And I have heard a lot about the Kiki Smith installation, had an opportunity to see that. We got to work with Kiki years ago on her retrospective, and that was great. And so it was just this wonderful opportunity to kind of set up the talk today. Um, what I wanted to do was spend some time talking about, you know, how do we create these kinds of experiences? What are some of the principles that are really important to us? And, and how do we go about working with this? So I'm going to show some behind the scenes uh, materials, play some videos and different things as I move through it. And for me, one of the most important things is, is emotive visual design that, that's so important um, to what we do. And this idea that we have in the studio that you design from the inside out. You start at the core. You start at what that visitor experience is and what that can be. And from there, you design out and around that. What I'm showing here is a project we're working on at the National Academy of Science Koshland Museum. And this is a floor plan of their 1,800-foot gallery. And you can see. How we're setting this up is ultimately related and centered around a decision-making table about climate science. We're here to get visitors engaged 
and start the behavioral shifts and changes that need to happen for us to actually start to, to deal with mitigating uh, issues related to climate science to continue for it to improve. And I think this diagram really shows, you know, we've got this pulse in the center, we've got the heart and soul in which the whole entire exhibit revolves around and it reaches out to the, the greater experience in the gallery that's an integration um, of not just media, but it's of objects and artifacts and stories. And as we look at how we're putting some of these experiences together, starting here with this table and, and building out the visualizations of how do we create an experience where someone is going to be very excited to want to work on mitigation strategies. I don't think that rises to the top of playful, fun interactivity, but yet it's something that's so important and it's something that people need to start to have a mind shift and a change for. But in order to, to address mitigation strategies, you have to understand the climate science itself, and then you have to start to see what are the impacts and the trade-offs. And so these are the kinds of visualizations that our team works on in uh, producing and creating uh, for this installation so that we can start to begin to communicate how we can craft this experience. And we're working with scientists. We have a 32 uh, member scientific steering committee that's reviewing our work. The science is often well over our heads of understanding and we need to break it down into the basic principles. And one of the key ways that we're able to do this is to really just visualize diagrammatic, diagram it out in a way that is very intuitive and meaningful to start to communicate the interactions. Um, I put in some other examples here. I think that giving visitors um, glimpses into worlds and allowing them to pique their curiosity and to, to peer into things is always a very, very exciting emotive opportunity. You can see here with the armory historoscope, I've got pictures of everyone viewing in. And what they're watching are little historical, playful videos that tell the founding of the armory. Um, Portland's known as Stumptown because they came through and cleared all the trees put in the cornerstone for this building. And so we're able to tell a history of a building that a lot of people are fascinated with. But when you talk about history, they don't really want to sit down and learn history. So we needed to find a, a fun way to, to pull them in, to want to watch these animations, to understand what these buildings were over time. And this is just one of about six different time periods and eras. But Providing those glimpses into worlds and, and letting their imagination move forward is always very fun. They had film screenings here. They had all kinds of events as it moved throughout time. It went, we have one session that had gone to the dogs because they ended up just showing, having dog shows there. Um, expressive creativity, I think, is another very important uh, principle, especially with technology today. Allowing visitors to be involved in, in creating. In this case, they're not necessarily contributing, but this is a tattoo booth um, at our Portland Art Museum. And they can come in as individuals or as groups, and they can actually start to go through the collections and find ways to have a moment of expression, which I think is always a, a great moment for visitors to have fun and engage um, with content and subject. In this case, it's looking at, at art from the collection. The other thing that's really important to our work is the content and the stories. Uh, for us, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but content's king, content's everything for us. And it's the content that inspires our visual design. So here at the Library of Congress, you know, we had amazing archives available to us. We're telling incredible stories and looking to that content to inspire our designs of what we're creating for our visitor so that as they move through the visitor experience at the library, there's familiarity with the content that starts to have this emotive, meaningful connection for the visitor, but it's also setting up um, the design standards, the style guides of how we, we move through this. So often we may look towards um, traditional graphic and communication design principles as our guiding light to what we're doing, but we're really trying to look to the content itself to find a meaningful way to inspire some of our visual design that we're working on. 
So those were some exploration studies. We often find ourselves just doing these mood boards. You know, like we've got to get to the heart and soul and the, the feeling of this experience. Um, at the world of Coca-Cola, we're dealing particularly with stories. A lot of our projects deal with stories. They could be um, a whole variety of stories. I mean, they can be more oral history. They could be factual in nature, et cetera. And we needed to look at um, the Live Positively campaign at the world of Coca-Cola and find ways to communicate what the uh, organization, the corporation is doing across the world and, and look at different studies of how to bring these stories to life, how to make them pop, how to make visitors be drawn to them and want to interact with these stories to learn more. And I have a little motion study. A lot of times what accompanies some of our, our static kind of comps and explorations are actual motion studies and, and finding ways to look at, you know, how do things come to life? What is the timing? You know, we're, we're working with a fluid medium where visitors are accessing certain things at certain times. How does that all come together? And how is that orchestrated in a way so that the visitors have that connection to the content? I wanted to show a, a piece that we did at the Grammys Museum. I think it's a, it's a great example. In this case, we're connecting music genres. Um, we've done lots of projects where we, we need to make connections and show relationships between things where visitors may not understand that, that there's a history or a connection or this scientific study had then inspired this innovation. And with music, it's a really great opportunity uh, to do this. We, We've worked um, throughout the early years of our work. Um, we worked with National Geographic. We worked with PBS Discovery. But we also worked down in LA with a lot of music um, companies, Virgin Records, Universal, DreamWorks, et cetera. And we were constantly working with this issue of the guys in LA, they're like, we sell sizzle, not steak. Just make it great. Make it cool. And then our clients kind of on the. East Coast, National Geographic, it's like, we sell steak. It's all about the content. And here we have, at, a, at the Grammys Museum, we have a wealth of hundreds and hundreds of music genres. But yet it's the sizzle of the music and the connections. And how do you balance that so that you have the sizzle along with the steak? And I think this is a great opportunity where pretty soon before you know it, you've connected you know, certain genres of music to other genres. So you might have started out you're interested in blues, but you could have you know, ended on polka for some reason, even though you have no interest in polka. But it's that connection and those inner uh, weavings that the visitor uses as they move through. So it's a lot of fun. And I, of course, had to wait long enough for punk to come up. <laughs> um, the other thing that's really important in a lot of our visual design is the narrative storytelling. Uh, at the case of the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, we're at the age of mammals, and we're telling a story of the Cenozoic period of 65 million years of uh, mammalian history. And, and how do we do that? And how can we use visual design principles to help us with that narrative storytelling? Because that narrative can often be complex. It's hard for visitors to understand. It's hard to transport them back to 65 million years ago because they really have no comprehension of what that was like or what that meant. So these are more studies to try to figure out how can the visual aspect of our work continue that, that storytelling moving forward. Um, I've mentioned it before. Uh, Visual design is obviously very important. It's a motive, it's aesthetic, but at the end of the day, it's the content and the stories. And they're everything to us of how we create the kinds of experiences. And I wanted to look at a few because really what we do in crafting these kinds of visitor experiences is we look at what is the storytelling framework? What is the armature? How can we organize this information in a way that a visitor then interactively can go through it? And we know visitors, you know, we have all different kinds of visitors using all different kinds of technology. They're going to enter at different points. They're going to jump to different places. And if it's basically just, hey, go crazy, tap, 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 well, they're not really going to be getting anything. So we do have to have some kind of structure behind it, hoping that no matter where those entry points are, they're able to then at least have a connection. 
That might only last for five seconds with, with some individuals today. The attention span is, is less and less, but, but it's critical to having a successful visitor experience. Um, this is a project at the Cleveland Museum of Art. They have a lifelong learning center, and it's looking at different ways to actually to look at art. And you realize that a lot of people don't really understand how to engage with art and how to look at it. And what are the different lenses in which that we could provide for visitors to do this. So in this case, you know, the subject, the object, and the context. And finding ways that we can do this within the gallery through media, but then also through wayfinding, through personalization, and then through the interpretive um, kind of breakdown that happens as visitors move into the gallery. So you can see the Lifelong Learning Center is, it's on the first floor, it's an opportunity as an orientation to set them up with the the tools that they need to then further that experience into the galleries itself. So we had everything from different science labs to understand the science behind art to different ways to look at, at subject and medium and so forth. And then we start to realize, well, we've got all these experiences and we, we've got this framework in which we're going to create them, but we've got all this different content types. And man, we've got content coming from all these different sources. It's in this kind of repository. It's over here in this department. Well, that department's going to create these. And we really have to organize and, and under, understand our content scope to be able to make these kinds of experiences real. And we spend a lot of time in this area just kind of organizing and understanding all of our content. Sometimes our content, in the case of the National Academy uh, project at the Koshland Science Museum, is data. And data can sometimes be uh, very mundane and not very interesting. It may have an interesting uh, you know, perspective if you look at it a certain way. But really, all data has to be shaped to be meaningful, to mean something. And we spend a lot of time working with data and with diagrams and, and doing the visualization and the information graphics behind it to communicate, you know, how are we going to look at mitigation standards and how are we going to allow those, uh, you know, the basic elements of mitigation to come forward and bubble up so that a visitor even begins to know what to do on the interface. So we're starting with um, very raw data and we're forming it and shaping it hopefully into something meaningful so that when a visitor looks at this experience, they're not overwhelmed. They know where to begin. They understand what it means. And by the way, I don't know if any of you know this today, but no one reads anymore. So if no one's reading and you've got to communicate con uh, complex concepts, you have to do it all visually. You know, and, and the reading aspect is, oh, well, if they want to dig deeper, then maybe you can have a paragraph for someone to read. Um, so that old, you know, traditional notion of, of storytelling through, through reading and so forth is something that we find, especially in um, public settings, is something that people aren't interested in doing. They want to just kind of go through very quickly. Um, we often are finding ourselves being able to visualize content and stories with geography and time. Um, we personally, lots of us at the studio, are uh, very passionate about this with mapping and timelines and ways to tell stories. This is a project close to us at Mount St. Helens, um, a volcano that erupted 30 years ago. And it's, it's the reemergence of life on Mount St. Helens. And we have a whole diversity of stories. And these stories are based geographically in different regions within the mountain. They're based over certain periods of time. And finding ways to break down those stories and get discrete information to our visitor so that they can really, if they're interested in the pyroclastic flows, they can go right there. They can hear from um, the scientists, learn what's going on in those areas, see the imagery. But then they could also pull back and create a larger story so that ultimately all these discrete objects and interactions that the visitors have any throughout time and place in this particular case, they're building a bigger story. And I think that's really what we get excited about and that's where our name Second Story comes from is that interaction where you as the visitor, you're creating the second story. We're essentially assembling information and graphics and context and everything for that story, but 
the way you piece it together, that's your own unique story, and that's the second story. We uh, work a lot in environments where we need to provide context. Context is something very important as we start to work with our content and our stories and our information. How can we provide interpretive context for someone so that they're understanding the context in which this is framed? And this is a project um, at the Idlejorg Museum. And the Idlejorg is a Native American and Western art museum in Indianapolis. And we really want to get visitors grounded first with this idea of, of personal stories and, and personal themes. And it's through those perspectives that you can then interact with the art and objects, with the outcome being that you become more knowledgeable about the, the culture in which these artifacts and objects came from. And so here we have an actual physical destination that we're working with. This isn't going to be online or out uh, you know, in mobile devices and so forth. These kinds of experiences are meant to be rooted within the institution itself. And as we set out, we, we always put together what our goals are for these experiences in the beginning. And, and this takes some time hashing through, working through what is it that's driving this kind of visitor experience. And making sure that as we work on these projects, and some of these projects can be two, three, five years long, that we're always staying true to our goals and to our visitor and what those experiences are for the visitor. So here you can see we've positioned them within space where we've talked about we need this moment where we're piquing their curiosity. They're coming in. And then pretty soon, we need to have an opportunity for them to take in and observe. Then we need them to actually start to explore and then ultimately discover. So we're layering and building that experience for our visitor as they're moving through space. This isn't something that we expect visitors to understand or to know. We don't even want them to understand it's there. It's just an intuitive process of, of how they move through the space and begin to interact. Interpretive context for us is very important with cultural objects. Uh, we, this is a project up in the um, in Anchorage at the Arctic Studies Center that's part of the National Museum of Natural History. And this is my poster family. I had them playing earlier. This, when I see these kinds of experiences happen, that is when I have this moment of uh, sense of pride and reward that, OK, after all that, it worked. When a young child can engage, you know, they move right to the bright, glowing boxes, of course, because it's like a television or a game or whatever. But pretty soon, this young child is starting to understand these objects and their cultural context. But what's more important is that that interactive media piece might have been an entry point for. But as you saw in the pictures earlier, that got her to go interact with the real thing. And there's nothing more than trying to facilitate and move that discussion. The, the interactive media might be a tool, but really, at the end of the day, it's, it's interacting with the real object, having the context, and being able to understand that. And I've got a little demo video of how this works. It's very simple. You know, We've got 14 cases within this uh, installation of beautiful, amazing, fascinating, incredible objects. And the objects are on view, but there isn't an interpretive context surrounding them. So that's what these interactive experiences allow the visitors to do. They can look at photos. They can get oral histories. They can understand the meaning behind these objects, how they were used, what were they, um, how are they pronounced, you know, how's the title of them in their native language pronounced, and all those sorts of things. And I think it's those moments that if someone spends literally 30 seconds on this or five minutes, they've had a rewarding, meaningful connection to the content. We're always facilitating storytelling. That, that's what we love to do. And there are narratives. This is actually Walt Disney. Um, this is an animation we created at the Walt Disney Museum where we used an oral history from Walt to tell his story as a young child. And um, Diane Disney Miller had seen the work I showed earlier with the armory and the kinds of animations we did there. And she said, that's what we need to tell the story of my father in the early years. Because we only have a couple pictures of him. We have a picture of my mom and a picture of my dad, but you know the photo albums, 
Many of those are actually at the Disney Corporation, so we don't have all these kinds of photos. So if we could use this kind of animation, use the narrative of my father telling his story, then all of a sudden this comes to life. And this narrative is, I think, just much more of a traditional narrative. It's a more passive. You're held captive by it. It's not interactive. Um, we tried to make it as short as we could, knowing that attention spans are what they are. Um, but you can really get a sense of, of Walt Disney and who he is and the kinds of things he did as a young child before he became the icon of Disney. And I wanted to play this because the way to facilitate storytelling in this particular case is truly with narrative. But when we look at the next project I'm going to show, which is the Computer History Museum, um, we have thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of artifacts telling the history of computing, you know, way back to the beginning. And over on the left side, you can see what that is, is that is a layout of their physical exhibition. And they came to us and they said, well, we have to get the entire physical exhibit into an interactive website. And so we started to map and chart all that and started to look at the mountains and mountains of content that we had to deal with. And we started to look at all the different pieces and components. We kind of blew up this section to start to talk about how we could begin to facilitate that. And through talking to them, we realized that there actually isn't this kind of meta-narrative to the history of computing. Um, they often found themselves at odds curatorially about where certain objects should be placed with what certain narratives and you know why isn't there a whole theme about military computing because it was the military that started computing. And what we realized that an interactive experience could provide is we could facilitate storytelling by making storytelling components. And then they could build all the stories they want. So at the core of it is actually not an object. You know, It's not the Atari in which everything gets built around, but rather it's the story that they want to tell related to gaming or Atari. And we can then build these story components and these threads in a meaningful way so that they can continue to facilitate this into the future, so that they can tell more and more stories. They can open it up to the public. Visitors can start to contribute and use the tools to tell the stories. And these are some of our information architecture diagrams of how we would put this together. Then we started to look at some of the visual explorations um, of how we would begin to do the visual design. If really what we're looking at is that the stories and the content of those stories is king, well, the visual design needed to really recede and be minimal in the background and, and really just help facilitate for the cues necessary to use the interface. And so it was an interesting challenge of finding ways to do that. And at the same time that we were doing you know, the visual design and working through the content and the story components, we were building a whole entire back end database system. And a lot of the projects that I showed, we actually use different systems to organize our uh, content. And, and we'll do it internally, whether we need to ultimately do it for the project or not. But a lot of them move through the project and become part of, of what it is, so that the clients are able to facilitate what they need to into the future to keep it a living, breathing experience. And so these are some different screens. You can see they can go through, they can build their own stories, they can put it, their threads together, and pretty soon they can start to organize things, and then they're in the interface itself, and they realize that what they've just created in this whole tool then becomes a way that visitors are going through that experience on the front end. So we start to kind of blur the edge between you know, the, the back-end tools that are facilitating it and the, the front-end tools that, that the users and visitors are using. And then, in this case, they have a lot of um, experts. There are a lot of people who are very passionate about uh, computing history, and they can contribute to this as well. So very different ways to facilitate storytelling. In this case, at the AIGA Design Archives, one of the things that is a big theme in our work is universal access to information. Uh, so many organizations, institutions have information that isn't 
on view for anyone to ever go see? And how can we digitize that and put that out there for the public uh, to begin to engage with? And so here we have a series of tools. These tools are open to all the chapters, um, the 64 chapters that are part of AIGA, so that they can contribute their design archives from their own chapters, from their own regions, and put that information in place. And I've interspersed these screens because back here, this, oops, I went back, sorry. I couldn't go back, just one. I'll fast forward. You can see as you're searching on the front end what the search would look like versus the search on the back end. As you're returning a list of entries on the back end, the data side, versus returning a list of entries on the front end of what the visitor experiences. And so these powerful systems are allowing um, organizations to continue to advance, to archive, digitize, and preserve, and to facilitate their storytelling, and also to allow visitors to contribute as appropriately to this, this medium. I put in this interesting project, which is the Vogel 5050, and I don't know how many of you might know who um, Dorothy and Herb Vogel are, but they're preeminent collectors of contemporary art. Um, they're amazing people. He, was a postal worker and she was a librarian. And on those salaries, they amassed one of the most amazing uh, collections. They're very eccentric, those are their cats. Um, they're wonderful people. And they amassed this collection when they um, got married and they went on their honeymoon. Their first place to visit on their honeymoon was the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. And as they got older and they needed to find a home for their collection, they gave it back to the nation. They gave it to the National Gallery of Art. And the National Gallery of Art, of course, was thrilled to receive this, um, but they didn't have the means available within the National Gallery to care for this collection and, and do the kind of preservation, conservation, storage, everything that was needed for it. And so Dorothy came up with this idea that she would disseminate this collection that she had spent her whole entire life on, and she would um, break up the collection and send 50 works to 50 different institutions, one in every state, and then that way, Everyone across the country had access to the Vogel collection. And when the press asked Dorothy, why would you do something like that? Why would you have amassed this whole collection only to disseminate it and break it apart? And she says, well, it can all live together online. And so it's the online website that's the only single compilation of their collection. And so I think it's a really interesting way as people begin to look at how they can use digital media, how they can extend these experiences for visitors. And what's great about this is this has a whole back end system just like I've shown you. But instead of having a specific institution use it, we have 50 institutions across the country using it. They're contributing storytelling exhibit components. They're able to add works from their own collection that might be of um, artists from the same time period or even similar artists or the same artists that they have in their collection. So it was a, a, a really rewarding experience to see something like that come full circle. I've talked a little bit about audiences. Um, audiences are everything to us. You're my audience tonight, which is wonderful and great. Um, but really, you put stuff out there for the public to consume it, and you, you have to think, how are you going to connect with these audiences? And for us, I've, I've shown some concepts, some storytelling frameworks, some overarching philo philosophical metaphors and how we hang our content together. This is a project at the University of Oregon. This is actually um, the university seal. And we looked at this. This was in our um, first meeting with this client in this conference room. And it's this big stained glass window. And we were really inspired by it. And we looked at the. We thought about you know universities. They're they're here for ideas and education and so forth, and the individuals that flow through that university and looking at these headwaters. We started to then um, recall one of our favorite books by Salman Rushdie, um, Harun and the Sea of Stories, and how looking at the seas of stories and the streams of stories and thinking about all the individuals, the 200 plus thousand. Uh, people that have gone through the University of Oregon and how the university itself is a bedrock in which all the stories and the people flow through. So we came up with um, a concept approach that was using waterfalls. I mentioned we get a lot of rain in Oregon, and so we have a lot of waterfalls. And having this way to have the, the, the 
the streams flow into this pool and into a visualization of all the alumni and having these cascading panels rippling down that are telling the university story. And what's really great about this uh, project is it's, called, it's an alumni center and it's going to open up in June. And, you know, the alumni, they're, they're behind it. But really, you know, they're helping to raise the funds to build all this. And we're here to respect and honor those alumni and everyone who's ever flown through the university. But more importantly, this is where all the prospective students, the tours, they start here. And this is where we're telling the university story. And some of those screens I was showing earlier in our um, studio, we've got 14 foot you know, basically giant iPhones that people are just scrolling through, getting it access to content about the university, all of the stories related to the university, um, the different academics, sports, et cetera. And so it's been really engaging. We've worked on this project for three years to see as we bring in all the diverse audiences through, they ultimately find a connection. And I think creating this framework and the structure of these very simple interactives that are filled with content, but that are bubbling up to the top is, is a great way that visitors can find that meaningful relationship. So we started to look at, at an experience map for our visitors, um, looking at ways, this just kind of diagrams, how are we engaging with them? How are they stepping back and observing? How are they exploring, discovering, and contributing? to this experience, and what do those kinds of experiences embody? What are some of our goals? What are some of our inspiration of projects that are out there that we've seen? How can we do this for each of these? And spending time up front and really thinking through this before just diving in and you know, creating whatever experience just for the sake of creating it is really a wonderful opportunity. It allows us to become very knowledgeable. By no means do we become experts on things like climate science, but we become very knowledgeable about it. We really get to know the university story. Here we've obviously got um, the contribution ways to leave, as we called them, digital footprints for the future. Um, the, Bonnie Pittman, who's the director of the Dallas Art Museum, last year was in the New York Times Museum section. and. I loved how she summarized her visitors. She said they're either participants, they're observers, they're enthusiasts, they're experts, or they're independents. And I thought, that is true no matter what you do in this world. No matter how you're engaging with anything, you're going to fall into one of those categories. And I just love thinking of visitors in that way that especially when we're designing these kinds of experiences, we're going to have a whole realm. How do you create something where you've got large groups of people for which a couple of them are active participants? Some of them want to sit back and observe. Others might be enthusiasts on the subject matter. Others might just be independents. They kind of could care less. And this is at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, where we're working with them to tell the story of Los Angeles, but to tell that story from this nature culture nexus. And how can we create these perspectives and these experiences for that range of um, visitor? How can we create something where we know we're just going to have someone sit back? They're never going to touch. Or we're going to have people who are actually um, experts on the subject matter, you know, the scientists and so forth, and their whole community of people that come in that know more about it. How can we make it fulfilling for them and, and span that whole scale? So coming up with these different perspectives, ways to create these pulses of Los Angeles using models that they have of LA, they've got these amazing artifacts, but yet the whole world has Google. So right then and there, it's like, well, Google set the bar for this experience. If you're ever going to do anything with mapping, it's never going to come close to what Google does. So how can we bridge that? How can we partner with Google? How can we create? Um, everyone in Los Angeles likes to, they, they talk about the areas they live as their own little neighborhoods, their own little um, cities. Well, how can they incorporate their stories? How can we create these kinds of Google mashups? And then obviously, finding ways we've got to get, in this case, um, outside of the museum. How do we use mobile and tagging and, and different forms of environments around the city to engage visitors in 
what's going on at the museum. The museum itself is, um, to a certain degree, restricted to telling the story of Los Angeles based on the artifacts they have. But they have holes, you know? They don't have tons of artifacts from the 20th century because they stopped collecting. So how can interactive media facilitate those discussions? How can we extend it for our visitors? Again, back to the idle jorg, we have the same situation where I talked earlier, in this particular case, we have a place. And, and place and space are very important and unique destinations. And when we think about everything that the web has to offer, everything that mobile devices have to offer, tablets, you name it, we've got all the latest and greatest gadgets and gizmos and widgets in our hands. What is ultimately going to make that place-based experience purposeful, meaningful? Why are people going to keep going to these places as destinations. And so if you know you're competing with all of this other stuff, how can you differentiate and stand apart? And I think, again, back to looking at, in, in this particular um, case, this museum, the sense of place is really important. It's rooted in who they are as an institution. It's a Western American art museum. They really want identity is a big part of, of what they have in there as well as community. So how can we use those themes to extend that experience for our visitors as they move through it? And again, diagramming this out, thinking through it, finding ways to really say, OK, you know, here we started to look at, well, we've got a spectator. The spectator's going to come in, and if they're there for a minute, great. But then we may have an average visitor, maybe three to five minutes. I think five to 10 minutes is pretty. Hi, uh, we're holding the bar, high, the bar high if we can get them there for five to 10 minutes. And then we may have a more engaged visitor. But how do we set up that visitor flow? How do we get those kinds of experiences so that when those individuals leave, it was meaningful to them of coming to that destination? And creating these environments, these are some early um, renders of this space, of this large wall of objects and media and ways to interact with those objects and so forth. We also find our self working in a lot of historical monuments. Um, there was a time in the studio's life where we were doing a lot of war-related work. There was a, th a theme where we had a certain administration and where war was getting a lot of uh, <laughs> publicity. And uh, we worked on the Civil War. We worked on World War II one, et cetera, et cetera. And we kind of put a moratorium on war in the studio because we thought we're all just getting dragged down by it. You know, we got to get back to our roots. We got to have a little bit of that rock and roll on the side to balance everything that was going on. And we had incredible opportunities, I'm going to show two of them, to work with these historical monuments. And, and people are going to these places because they have a certain meaning uh, in time, in history, in American history. And how can we, in this case, this is Gettysburg um, National Military Park and Museum. How can we create experiences? Here they're inside a museum, but they can walk out onto the battlefield. And they can go to the sites and see and hear the stories of what was going on at Gettysburg that day. But what we actually did with the interactives is we mapped the three days of the war and the positions of the troops throughout the three days. So believe it or not, with young males, they love this. And they really got into figuring out where everyone is and who was doing what. And man, they knew their Civil War history. And so it was really great to see them get so excited uh, to dig in deeper, to see the alignments and the positions, and then to know they're at a place where if they literally walked you know, 50 feet they're on the battlefield. Um, here we're looking at one where, uh, in the beginning, visitors are getting introduced to this concept that the country was divided at the time over slavery. And they're starting to understand what was going on in each state. What was each state saying at that time? And larger groups are working on it together. I love this picture because you can see it's all just younger audiences up there interacting. And then you have an older gentleman sitting back and observing. And so many times you hear, even though they're observing, you won't believe what I just did. You got to come see this thing. You just won't believe it. And I always get a kick out of it because they didn't actually 
do anything. But they partook in it. And, and it, they had a meaningful experience with that and started to understand that content. This is uh, the Great War Table at the World War I Museum, which is the Liberty um, Monument for World War I in Kansas City. And what's great, these are a group of school Boy Scouts, students, whatever, younger kids that had come in. And here they are. These, these artifacts surround them in this space. And this is their opportunity. Of course, they get to learn how machine guns work. But they can decode Zimmerman telegrams. They can learn about space flight patterns and everything. And it's all right there in context, because they can literally turn around, and there's a whole set of cases of machine guns. And they can start to make those um, connections and understand the war. And I think. In this particular video clip, I'm not showing it, but what was really great at the World War I Museum was it's, it's the forgotten war. And I forget the stat of how many millions of people died, but it, it's unbelievable. And to be able to bring that back up to today's times and to reflect back in history and to understand what happened in that war and how certain lines got drawn and how that has then led to some of the conflicts and issues that we're in today. And having visitors have that connection to history and understanding it. We're often challenged with trying to create meaningful relationships. Um, you know, a lot of us have our, our iPads or our iPhones or our Androids, and we have these love affairs with these things. And we love them. And we do all kinds of great things with them. And we couldn't live without them. Well, we're competing against those so sorts of things. So you can find ways, and I'll talk in a minute about how we can just extend those and use those in environments, but how you can also take what we learn from those kinds of experiences and apply them to larger scale um, interactives that are group based, that aren't kind of one on one type things. This is a project I'm showing some digital tags for. Um, the Institute for Emerging Issues that's in North Carolina that will be an area within a new library that's being built on the NC State campus. And we have the task of making public policy emotive and engaging so that people take action and get involved. And uh, at first we thought, hmm, I don't know if we can really do that. And we spent some time with the clients and we learned what their, their process was. And, and we started to think, like, can we really do this? Like, Are people really going to find an interest in public policy? But what we started to realize was when you break it down to issues, all of us are faced with issues today. All of us have opinions. All of us have perspectives. We, most people are very happy to talk about those things and to get engaged in debate. Well, we can leverage that and leverage this way to personalize this information and put it out there so that people can start to mobilize and start to take action. And in this case, it's all about progressing, continuing the progress in North Carolina of, of what they've been working on. So these are mock-ups that we've done. We actually then get these into um, interactive little proof of concept prototypes. I haven't spent much time talking about that. Um, aspect of what the studio does. But it's really important for us. I've shown some diagrams and things, but we've got to get out of paper fast. Because paper is not the world we work in. We work with technology. We work with different devices and platforms. And this whole um, series that I've put together, we rapid prototyped that in a half a day. We had it on a multi-touch table. We had about six different people in from the community that weren't familiar with the project. They immediately began playing with it. And we had videos up on Vimeo the next day for our clients. So we could start to realize what is happening. What are we learning from our visitors? Does this, you know, it's a proof of concept. Does it even work, et cetera? So simple diagrams, information diagrams, et cetera, allow us to then do really quick, quick, rapid prototyping. Another big component to having meaningful relationship is games. We all know that uh, many people younger than I love playing games. Uh, I went to Jane McGonigal's presentation at South by Southwest, and she said, anyone who was born 1980 on will have 10,000 hours of gaming by the time they're 21. And it's a, it's a big part. And gaming isn't just the you know one person shooter up, what have you. But here we've created games and activities at the Library of Congress where visitors take treasure hunts 
through the library to find historical objects and artifacts to connect. And I just played a little demo video of it. And these visitors then can extend their experience online. We, of course, did this a couple years ago. They don't quite have a mobile experience yet for this. But these games really do create meaningful relationships. So finding ways to put the mechanics of games into these experiences is really great. C creating activities. This is a, um, an interesting project at the New York Botanical Garden. These are some of our visualization exploration studies where they wanted to create a virtual experience of what it's like to go to the botanical gardens in New York. And so we started playing around with this, and we realized that pretty soon, when we were taking photographs of this space, we thought, there's no way we can just do, you know, like a, a 3D panor panoramic of this, because you can't get the details of the plants. It all blends in. Everything just looks green, and you can't differentiate between one or the other. So we started to come up with ways of taking these images and really looking at how could we begin to illustrate these experiences and bring them to life so that <clears throat> we could cue visitors to very particular um, plants, et cetera, that we, we wanted them to stop and discover. And again, this activity, it, it's a game-based experience, and it can all be done outside of the botanical garden. And what's interesting is they bring tons and tons of school tours and students through this space. But they weren't able to put these kinds of experiences within the space. So they wanted to use the web as a vehicle to push both the pre and post visit. And I'm going to play a little video of it so you can get a sense of, of what it's like. But just trying to find ways to pull out all the details and illustrate all the fine uh, subtleties of these plants to be able to tell those important stories to hook into the scientists and so forth. So this is the actual uh, botanical garden. It's beautiful. If you haven't been there, I'm a big plant fan, so I encourage you to go. But these are some screens, and the, the resolution of the video isn't that great, but you can get a sense of how we could begin through illustration to cut out a lot of the, you know, the blur of everything just looking like one big thing and uh, drive the visitor's attention to certain plants so they could go on the scavenger hunt. And uh, you can see here, the students are coming through. They're using this. And a lot of them have either done the virtual plant hunter before or after. So they come in very knowledgeable. And in some cases, teachers have extended, if they've done it before, to send them on very specific tasks when they're here. Um, so it was a great kind of rewarding way to get them to connect with the plants and the importance of plants and science. Um, as we look at our visitors, we know uh, for visitors to be creators and contributors is really, really important. Um, what I have playing here is the, this is at the Kansas City Royals Hall of Fame. And they have uh, a fan base that I guess is very passionate about baseball, at, who come into the Hall of Fame, obviously. But they, I guess there's a big thing about designing baseball parks and, oh, if I could control and make the outfield this distance and what if I brought these in and I could do this and that and I want to have more box seats or more general seating. So we came up, um, because the, the visitors were really interested in this sort of thing, how could we in real time generate in 3D the ability for visitors to create their own ballpark, however they wanted to create it and then share it with people. And it was a really... Um, Great experience to look at what the 3D engines could do. How could we open up the possibilities? How did we have to dial in and restrict certain things that we couldn't accomplish? And so it was really fun. And it is one of the most popular uh, experiences there at the Hall of Fame. And I, of course, was thinking the whole time, really? People want to build their own ballpark? Whatever. OK, I guess. But it's been, been very, very popular because, again, you're giving the visitors the controls to create something. These happen to be a lot of visitors that want to create this sort of thing because they're passionate about it. But anytime you can give them the vehicle to, to create, and that was the same at the Portland Art Museum with the Body Collective, was very popular. They have an amazing collection. Um, Native American and indigenous art and 
I don't know if many of you have been to Portland lately, but we're a heavily inked city and have lots of tattoos. So they, the art museum thought, well, let's reach out and pull in a different audience that may not come in here. And we'll put this installation and this exhibit together. And so pretty soon, visitors found themselves going through the collections, the museum collections, and finding the most amazing, beautiful um, tattoos that they could then apply to their body. We also mixed in some current flash artists. And then this went up you know, automatically into Flickr and all sorts of things to perpetuate. And again, very I showed some pictures earlier, but very, very popular um, with, with visitors because they were creating. So what I see in the world today, and we, we talk about this a lot, we work um, with a lot of mediums. I talked early on. And, the web, and the web was coming out. And I don't know how many of you designed for the web back then, but the browser wars were unbelievable. And certain things worked in some browsers and not in others. And some people had this bandwidth, and some didn't. And you had to do all this stuff to make it work. Well, we're here again. And we're here with apps. We're here with phones, mobile devices, tablets. And so our goal is to always get to this idea of Pope, which is produce once, publish everywhere. And I think we, as a studio, we've made certain strides. But as an industry, we're, we're, we're trying to make more strides towards this. Um, definitely the publish everywhere, that's Everyone expects everything everywhere. But how to produce it once and make it work everywhere is a whole other challenge. And I think that as um, the medium and the industry has evolved, you've seen this opportunity to separate presentation from content. And you saw in some of the earlier examples, we're, we're putting stuff in, in back end systems and we're organizing it in a way that it's all there and it can be accessed regardless of what the presentation is. They're no longer married. And some of the early works when I showed the little 90 second clip of 94 to 2004, that was back in the day where you integrated content and design. Everything was highly uh, connected. Well, now we're at a point, this is a project with a um, high museum of art. It's a mobile app. How do we create these experiences of sharing and community and having visitors get involved in the exhibition through their own devices. Because whether we like it or not, all of us are pretty much wired. Even my five-year-old niece at times is wired when she's carrying my sister's iPhone around. So we, we all have it available to us. So how are we going to extend it and leverage it in a meaningful way so that you're having a meaningful interaction with the content, with the stories, to engage, pique your curiosity, extend your knowledge of something. So we're working on wireframes and so forth of, of how to do this kind of experience that the high wants, which is really, they don't want to just do another mobile tour. They don't want to have just another audio tour and another video and so forth. They really want to engage the community, and they want people to start sharing and tying into their social media. So some of these comps that we're working on and approaches are ways to engage visitors to, to use the phone and use sensing devices so that they can actually capture things, learn more, share with the community, add their comments, et cetera. And I think it's interesting to think about this is one app, but it could become many more things. And so that's why, well, how can we produce it once and have it work lots of places? <coughs> Sorry. I was afraid this was going to happen. I ended up getting laryngitis on Friday, which I've never had before in my entire life to that extent. So I, of course, was panicking as to whether I would make it through this presentation. But I'm getting close to the end here. Sorry. Um, so. <clears throat> As we continue to move into these platforms and iPads and iPhones, and there's lots of infrastructures out there and systems that we can use, it's a great way to continue to say to us, Pope, produce once, publish everywhere. How can we do it? Um, I wanted to show some pieces. This is a project that we did for Adobe that I think is the closest to what we've been able to do and delivering on multiple platforms. This is called Infinite Creativity. And we were working with Adobe. 
they needed to have an installation at their, um, the Tech Museum in San Jose. And John Warnock has helped start that museum, so it was very important to them. And we brainstormed with them and thought about, well, how can we do this? What is it about Adobe that we want to, what do we want to get at? And everyone in our studio said, let's just get back to their roots. Their roots are creativity, and that's what Adobe does. It, they leverage the tools to advance the creativity. And so we were able to create an experience for multi-touch screens, for tablets, and for mobile apps where visitors can contribute. And collectively, you know, it's the exquisite corpse, where basically they can contribute what they're drawing and creating to a greater whole. So it could be a group-based experience um, within the museum, but then you could use your mobile devices. And we just got back from a show in Amsterdam where it was all deployed on the Galaxy tablets. And we were using that. So I think that the frameworks and so forth for doing that are, are right there and are great opportunities. And this was a really um, wonderful opportunity Adobe extended to us to be able to explore that. I wanted to finish with some of our um, connect hacks that we've been working on and gestures and games. And that's really in terms of creating these unique destinations and so forth. It is creating these kinds of experiences for our visitors that are going to start to differentiate between everything that they're coming in with, that they're wired with, that they're using in their day-to-day -day life in terms of how they're accessing forms of information, entertainment, et cetera. So I thought that'd be a fun note to end on. And thank you very much. This, you're a great audience, and I appreciate it. So I would be happy to take different questions that people may have, things that, sure. I think there are some microphones. There's one right here. Hi, thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi. Thank you for, for being here tonight. And I almost thank you. hate to ask such a detailed technical question after that um, wonderful overview of everything you're doing. Um, but I'm curious as to whether or not you've taken a look at uh, stereoscopic displays and whether or not that has enough potential that, um, that it would quantitatively change the interactions. Yes, we have. In fact, there were a couple of projects where we wanted to use stereoscopic imagery. And for a variety of reasons, those installations didn't get built. But at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, we're looking at that specifically and using what I, that kind of a low tech approach with a high tech approach to realize those more environmental 3Ds. So, yep. <coughs> Sorry. Are there other questions? Hi. Hi there. I'd like to know uh, how do you measure what you do and, and what do you do when you fail? We fail a lot. <laughs> I just didn't want to show any of it. <laughs> um, no, we, uh, there's lots of ways to measure things. Uh, you know, on some of our projects, we're working with um, evaluation teams, formative evaluation teams, sometimes on the front end, sometimes on the back end. Then there's also, with uh, a lot of the interactive installations we put in place, we build in back-end systems that can track metrics. So for example, at the Library of Congress, everything that we put there had a back-end metrics and was tying to the web. <clears throat> and we were able to get uh, quantitative information from that to understand how many people were using the personalization devices on site, and then how many were continuing that experience online, what percentage were we getting, what was the length of stay once they did go online. So we can get a lot of that. And then we also use a lot of Google Analytics for things just to track basic, um, basic metrics information. But really, at the end of the day, it's often finding ways to work with our users and our audiences before we deploy things to see, is it really an emotive connection? Are people really connecting and beginning to use it? And that, to me, is the most effective. It's kind of a, 
not that the formative evaluations aren't, but it's kind of that gut reaction to start to see, oh, people are really drawn and they're using and it, it's moving forward and you can see how that idea could progress. Um, and we do get follow-up feedback. A lot of our clients will do the summative evaluations and put together reports and so forth so we can see more specifically very detailed information. So. And failing's fun, too. You, know, you just have to be careful. You don't want to completely fail and then your client's <laughs> upset. But a lot of that process, that iterative process we go through in the lab is all about that. We may have some idea, a proof of concept, and it's, it's not good. It's horrible. It doesn't resonate with people. So then we have to go back and iterate on it and change it. Other questions? <clears throat> Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about where someone could start from if they have more of a print background. Um, just to kind of frame the question, I'm a student graduating mm -hmm. with a, pretty much a print portfolio, and I'd really like to get more interactive and web experience, and I'm not sure I want to go back to school for that. So. No, you don't need to go back right. to school. Right, okay. <laughs> no, I think um, I had the luxury, you know, I came out with a... a BFA in graphic design. I had the luxury that our industry is an infant, you know. It's like I joked, we had our sweet 16 party last year, and I'm like, all right, we're old enough to drive, and in a couple of years, we're going to go off to college. I got to see it progress, and I got to start when it was very rudimentary and basic, and then it evolved, and it's got more and more and more and more complicated to all these specialists. And, you know, now I don't know how to do half the things that we do personally. I can't program that stuff anymore when back in the day I could. And I think that often people can find interactive media as intimidating because it's like, well, I got to learn all these things and I, I got to learn how to do Flash or I got to learn how to do OpenGL. And you don't. And I think it's really the fundamental basic principles in, in visual design and communication design and critical thinking and problem solving that you can bring no matter what your medium is. It's the same as it is in print, as it is in interactive. You might have some different um, restrictions or so forth in terms of in interactive, you might be limited by certain technology, but in print, you're limited by certain capabilities of, of executing that print. So it's really, it's really the same uh, core principles that I think that you can carry with you and use them across um, any medium. I think for someone who wants to excel in interactive design, they do have to spend time with developers. They have to start to become native in how to communicate about it and understanding what the issues are and so forth. But that doesn't mean they have to know how to do it. And I think some people, when you bring technology into the mix, it just creates a whole can of worms. I mean, it's complicated, detailed stuff. And some people have an affinity and an interest to be involved in that, and some don't. And so that that can be a defining factor, but really, I think that just core design communication, it's about problem solving, critical thinking, ways to, in our case, how do we communicate stories? How do we put these frameworks together so that visitors have the experiences? So I wouldn't be intimidated by it. <clears throat> Other questions? Yeah. Um. One of the things that I think is really challenging working with digital media like this is kind of the ephemeral quality of it. Yep. And um, You know that the minute you put it out, it's going to start to get dated and you know, more yep. the hardware and software than the ideas maybe. But now that, that we're working with new, especially the social media tools where you're able to collect artifacts from the visitors themselves, are you finding that any of your clients are actually looking at those things becoming long-term assets that they would mm -hmm. maintain in time beyond the scope of the project itself? Yeah, definitely. And I think um, to the first part of your question, that, that is one of the problems using this kind of technology. I mean, we will be involved in projects and they'll say, well, you know, we're going to break ground in a year and we're going to finally open in four years and we need you to come in and in the next three months figure out what all the experiences are going to be. I'm like, well... You kidding me? Whatever I think of today is going to be outdated by the time you open. So trying to create that timeless experience for the visitor and then hopefully using as state-of-the-art technology as you can 
at the time, but without having to use all the bells and whistles and the wows. So trying to kind of minimize that, that will date it so that it can try to stay timeless is a big part of it. And we are finding more and more clients are engaging with the communities, with the people, and contributing. And these tools that we created for so long that were always like behind the wall just for the institution, they're now out in front. They're part of the whole experience where they're contributing. And those clients are making commitments to that content. In our case, it's, it's digital content. Um, so I haven't worked with clients yet that are taking on the physical aspect of it and making commitments to that because of the cost. But in terms of the digital and so forth, we are finding that they're moving in that direction, so, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, storytelling innovations. Mm -hmm. The innovation seems to be in the medium and in the tools you utilize. How are you studying storytelling in general? The narrative part, the scripting, what are the creative ways you're looking towards that? Yeah, I think for us a lot of, because we are using the medium of, of interactivity and technology, our approach to storytelling is, is breaking down those narratives and coming up with frameworks and structures for all of the discrete little stories and components. Um, I think sometimes people, they'll, they'll say to me, oh, you're a storyteller. It's like, well, I don't really think of myself as a storyteller. I think of myself more as someone who is organizing the information and all of the components in the, in the storytelling pieces and nuggets of information in a way that then ultimately you're the, you're the storyteller. So I, I've moved that now to be your responsibility, it's your interaction, you're creating your story, and how you build that is unique to you. Versus more traditional forms, which are still great and viable, whether it's film or book or what have you. Um, it's just a different approach to how to do the storytelling. Other questions? Yes? <clears throat> So did Second Story design the AIJ archives? Yes, we did. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we were happy to. <laughs> no, it's a, it a great opportunity. We actually did that, started that project five years ago with AIGA when they had about 2,000, 2,500 um, digitized materials at that time. They didn't have a home for the permanent collection. And um, we created a back-end system. And of course, the front-end delivery mechanism was all in Flash, because we wanted people to be able to personalize and customize and create slideshows and do all the things they needed to do. But Flash is closed off world. And so we decided that um, it was five years later. They had about 22,000 objects in the collection. And we needed to get that out. We needed to put it all into HTML5. We could do some of the same kinds of things that we had done in Flash five years ago in HTML5 and make it available to the public. And now people can, it's all available through web services. So different uh, organizations can program against it with APIs and things like that. So it's much more open and available. And now the chapters have access to all the tools and they can upload their own regional archive and so forth, so. Good, it's great to hear. Other questions? I can't see really, so I'm assuming if, was there a hand up there? I see. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. How many, hello? How many traditional designers are on your staff versus uh, more of the developers and programmers and back-end people? You know, it's actually, it's a kind of about half. It's, it's kind of divided in thirds, and each team has roughly 10 people in that arena. So it's, it's pretty much a 50-50 split across all of them. Um, and the designers, you know, some of the designers have gone, are young, 
just graduated and taking courses in interactive. Some are old, like me, and did design communication. So we have a whole range of different designers, which is great because they all collaborate and work with each other. And we have an architect. In the, so they have different training and different background and different um, ways of thinking and problem solving that's really great. But yeah, it's a, it's a good balance. Because really, our studio takes projects on where we work on them from concept through completion. And so in the beginning of a project, it's important that all team members are there. You know, yeah, sure, we're not actually developing some of this stuff in the beginning, but we're going right into rapid prototyping. The developers are creative. They've got ways to problem solve and think through issues, and they're right up there in the beginning. And then all the way through to the end, while we're putting the finishing touches, the designers are there. So it's really multidisciplinary and collaborative in how we bring the teams together. So I think we have time for one more final question, if there is one out there. I keep stepping forward because I can't see. <laughs> Is there one more down? OK, in front. Great. <clears throat> so in the process of starting these projects, how much is brought to you by the client about? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I have my coat on. Uh, I was just wondering, when you get the projects themselves, how much you guys are influencing the actual story itself? I mean, do they come to you and say, it could be this, it could be this, or do you do you have a lot of influence on that, or do they say, make this cool? Um, <laughs> sometimes our clients just say, make this cool. But most of the time, we're helping to shape and inform it. And they're bringing us on as a, as a partner of someone who has experience in understanding how to do these kinds of experiences. So we're, in essence, designing and consulting. We're by no means, though, ever the expert. So often our clients the expertise is with them or with an associate or something. And so we're really coming to the table to learn and be informed and bring our knowledge of what we do well and our native speakers in to help shape the ultimate experience of, of what it'll be. And they bring their knowledge and their expertise of what they know. So it's really a collaboration. And it's an iterative process of building and looking at how we can do this and you know, putting out ideas and so forth and, you know, having them be shot down for all the different reasons that they don't work um, by those experts and, and vice versa. You know, they may put out ideas and it's like, well, you know, actually that kind of springboards us over here in this area because we want to, you know, not pursue that particular idea. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. This was great. You're a wonderful audience.